what is good everybody man let me know if y'all can hear me in the chat uh been a long time coming man had to had to had to hop on a live show we got a lot to talk about um man calling lines already open i know people got opinions left and right about everything that went on this weekend we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach with it though look man everybody in every single social uh everybody in every single social media space has commented had some sort of opinion you know played the whole who's right who's wrong man listen that's not that that's not what i want to do here um Listen, we're going to I'm going to bring the facts about what happened, man. I'll I'll show you guys read statement, Bethune statement, some of what uh, the players have put out there. But, man, for me, just in this space, in terms of media, the coverage that I try to offer, I, I think there's certain issues and certain things that me personally due to my background, due to where I come from, due to who I am, is not really my place to address. Um, So for me, like, I'm not going to come on here and talk about any institutional I- issues with Bethune-Cookman, whether Edry was lying, whether Edry was telling the truth, whether Bethune-Cookman's lying, telling the truth, like, taking sides or anything like that. I'm just going to give y'all what was said give y'all the information that we have. And if you want to call in and give your opinion, that's fine. I just don't feel like it's my place in this space to have any sort of hard line opinion or, or try to drag Bethune Cookman or Ed Reed or anything like that. That's just, I don't, I don't think that's my spot in the media space, which is this whole situation. So I just wanted to kind of throw that, throw that out there first off. Uh, the call in number seven zero one seven seven nine nine five eight five. Just kind of give you guys my perspective to start the show as people kind of roll in here. It's just there's certain things when I, I just been from uh, some of the things I've heard have just been outrageous, man. I mean, not even just the Bethune Cookman thing. Also, I, I know there's another thing on our social media that's been flying around in terms of Jackson State. I, I don't think that's my place to talk about that either. So if you want to talk about it, that's fine. I'm just letting you guys know where I'm drawing the line on the show. But we already got the first caller, man. Let me bring him in. 9521, you're live. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for doing it a different way. I'm like one of the uh, Wayne who says – He's unsubscribed. So I'm not from HBCU. Um, I live in Virginia via Colorado, the 720 number. So I have ties to Colorado. I love Colorado before Dion. I was there. I I do want to talk about the, the Ed Reed situation. What he did, I think, was wrong. But more importantly, I'm I'm more concerned about how Bethune Cookman's going to handle it and how it looks for HBCUs overall, not what he said or how he said it or just in general. He's a Hall of Famer, so people are going to hear his voice louder than they're going to hear Bethune Cookman. And you know, when when you're only hearing, or I shouldn't say when you're only hearing, but Shaq shared his his thing. That's 29 million people that Bethune is never going to reach. So there's only one side that's being heard. And whether it's right or wrong, it's still putting it out there in a negative light. So that is what I'm going to address. The other thing with Jackson State, there's, again, it it really doesn't matter. You know, I, I don't know whether the coach was there and talking to the kids and all of that. That's NCAA's job, not mine. But again, it's a negative content that's being put out there. And, you know, Deion Sanders has 20 million, million viewers. You only, when you, when you go up against or, or have these opinions and you go, oh, we don't care, we're going to be fine, and they don't know the whole story, they'll never know the whole story. You don't have the reach. You don't have the reach for 29 million, for 20 million, for eight, you know, for half. You don't have that reach. So you have to think of 
of why is these things happening and how are you going to fix them? I don't, you know, a lot of this to me is in-house. And I, again, I'm not HBCU bound, you know, so I don't know the ins and outs. But I do know just, I guess, a little bit of common sense and branding. I do know branding and your brand is looking bad. And instead of who was right, who was wrong, what was said, what was not said, why not work on, let's just fix this. You know, fix this. PR is a beautiful thing. You, someone needs to start using it. And, and these, these platforms and these statements that are, are trash, they're not helping your cause. You need to help your cause now. And, and, I, and that's really all I had to say. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate your take. Thanks for calling in. Oh, let's see. Uh, Adrian, I don't know what you're talking about exactly, but hey, I do not know. But um, and as we get this thing rolling, uh, so as many people have been talking about the Ed Reed thing, man, let's just uh, let's just go ahead, man. The official statement from Ed Reed in terms of what happened yes you know this this past weekend just pretty much talking about that Bethune Cookman wasn't going to ratify or finalize his contract and that he was you know pretty much stepping away you had the Instagram live where it was really the team addressing and I think there was also a TikTok that came out from one of uh, the players parents who was on a recruiting visit where they got to talk directly to the AD that leaked on TikTok I believe as well but um I'm pretty sure a lot of people have seen the statement. It's giving you all a bit of the time to read it. This was the first thing to to really drop in terms of the situation is that he dropped the official statement and then the media wildfire went absolutely berserk with it. I'll take a call. We have this up. Hello, one three Blue, you seven doing? five. Good. You're live. All right. Thank you very much for having me on your platform, sir. I support your platform. Subscribe, like, and share the content, please, everyone that's listening in. Um, the one thing that I can say is that what the, the opportunity for um, Batuman to, to really take advantage of is now lost. Um, anybody trying to help them with their cause. For, first of all, Ed Reed is, you, and I'm pretty sure you will know, that is well documented. Um, he's linked to a lot of different people. And we're talking about people who have connections with corporations such as D.R. Sanders, um, the likes of Shaquille O'Neal, um, other other venues where they can help support building that college, and that's lost because of pride. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say what they what they uh, who's at fault, but this could have easily easily been taken care of by simply state um simply trying to fix what Ed Reed was talking about was the issue. When you have your football players um, petitioning for them for for um, them to reinstate Ed Reed, and then you have students who are gathering to protest what you have done, should be signed that maybe you didn't make the right decision. Maybe you should really consider going the other way instead of trying to hold on to what you believe he said, how he said it was wrong. Regardless of how he said it, the fact is that it's true. And that's all I have to say about that, sir. I want to thank you again for allowing me on your platform. Hey, appreciate the call, man. Um, The only response to that I'll say is this is – of. Like, yes, some of the players are – I think they're planning a protest on Monday, and we're going to get into some of the statements. But at the end of the day, you still – I don't think you can let the the players run the program. He still had to face some sort of discipline for what he did. I don't think it – I will – I say that. I don't think that's 
arguable is that he shouldn't have went on Instagram Live and said what he did. I mean, I said it on Scotty's show the other day where I've ranked him fourth in terms of SWAT coaching hires just because of the bridge, the bridges that he burned. Man, I don't think people understand. He went on Instagram Live, insulted the president of the university, consistently ripped the university and, and all this. And the argument isn't whether it was if, if what he was saying was right or wrong. It was you you can't do that. There, there's a way to do things and there's a way to approach situations to get what you need to done done. You, you can't do that at the end of the day, regardless of. I mean, I, I don't know how many people are in the chat right now or anything like that, but how many how many of you guys could insult your direct boss on social media and still have a job come tomorrow? I I I don't I don't I don't think there's many people in the chat unless you're your own boss that that could go and do that. But moving on, man, BCU broke their silence yesterday afternoon with an official statement where they supposedly said they did a detailed assessment review of the state of the football program and decided to go in another direction. Um, so they, so I think there's a lot of confusion of what happened. So they had an agreement in principle, which means they had the contract terms, everything set. The only thing it wasn't done is finalized and you have to go through some processes at university level to get that finalized, get that approved. And they were working through that when all of this happened. So it's really up to them whether to approve it or not. And, and they ended up not doing that. And therefore that caused every to go on Instagram live and, and say whatever. But Bethune Cookman said they looked at their football program. They took a survey of where things were with their entire institution, athletic department, and they went in a different direction and they had the right to do that regardless of whether you're it, it's right or wrong. In your opinion, they had the right to do that. And the players, though, I think are getting the most attention on social media. I saw a lot of people arguing whether how important the players' opinions are and things like that. We had a player interview with HBCU Sports this weekend where he called it a slap in the face and that within a few weeks he was he already had practice fields being built, extended the training room, and were taking some – steps behind the scenes to further improve the program. And on Monday, they're going to participate in the campus protests and everything like that. But I don't think it's going to change anything. At this point, all of us can, I think all of us in the chat, everyone on the channel can agree, the bridge has been burned. Regardless of what the players do say, anything like that, Ed Reed is not going to be the next coach at Bethune-Cookman. And and he can't. I, at the end of the day, he can't. Like I, like I told Scotty and everyone who watched the show last Thursday, I, I just I didn't see how it was going to be a healthy relationship moving forward. There was it, there's there's a point where you've said what you needed to say. You sa said the way you say it, the the I would say the platform you posted on your tone. What, what you say, I mean, there, there's just too much that you've burnt around you and too many bridges and too many people you've upset and offended and, and targeted that I don't think, I don't think it, regardless of what the players say, what the, the other celebrities say, what people who support every say, I mean, the relationship has been irrep like there's irreparable damage to that relationship. And there's, there's no, there's no way to go forward. I, I did. I don't see it. I I don't know if someone could call in or, or comment any way you could go forward with it. I don't. I don't think there's any way to fix that. And so for me, listen, th that's where we are with it. But I, I wanted to take time. I know a lot of people went live on Saturday, went live on Sunday, but I, I reached out to the few people I know inside Bethune Cookman. I reached out to some coaches I know on the coaching circuit that I have good relationships with that would give me some good info, you know, under uh, as long as I kept them anonymous in terms of who gave me the info. I do have what looks to be a potential shortlist for Bethune-Cookman moving forward. 
And this is something I don't think a lot of people want to address or, or want to talk about, but there's going to have to be a higher moving forward. And I talked a little bit about this on She Loves Z podcast. She invited me on for a few minutes is there's only really two avenues you can go. National signing day is about 10 days away. Do you want to rush to hire and hope that you have a staff or some or, or some sort of like quote unquote skeleton staff in place right now to potentially try to salvage as much of national signing day as you can? Or would you rather just chalk up your losses, see what you can do on national signing day in terms of getting kids to commit to the school and the program rather than a, than a, a figurehead of a head coach and you take your time and make sure you hire the right guy. Those are the two paths. And I'm interested to see which one Bethune Cookman takes at, at this point, or if they're forced into one, because I, I talked a little bit about it on another show. A lot of coaches with national signing day coming up are going to be hesitant to leave their program right before national signing day. Just be just because of not 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 politics, but just courtesy. And they don't want to leave their staffs, their their kids and everything that right before National Signing Day and put them in a weird position. So I really do think they're going to take the longevity approach in terms of taking their time, vetting, vetting out their process, and hiring the correct coach. Now Three of these names were names that were that were hinted at beforehand. I, I can confirm two have been interviewed. Two of these guys did interview before they hired Ed Reed, and another one has I already have confirmed has interest in the job, has reached out, but hasn't heard back from the university. So these are legit names that potentially are going to get a look at at this job, and we'll see if they still have any interest or not. Now, Kevin Sumlin's the first name. He did ha- he did have at least one or two interviews with Bethune Cookman before they decided to go with Ed Reed. the The holdup with Kevin Sumlin now is that he's coaching for the Houston Gamblers. That's that season is getting ready to start pretty soon. Is he going to be willing to? dip out of that job right before the season starts. It seems a lot more unlikely than it was when he was interviewing in November, December. And I think he's probably the most, one of the most accomplished coaches out of, out of all these in terms of he has experience at at the highest level, man. He's been a head coach at Houston, Texas A&M, Arizona. He's been an OC at, at Oklahoma. He, he coached at his, as an assistant at AM before that, has been at Minnesota, Wyoming, Washington State, has coached a Heisman winner in Johnny Manziel. It would be really and truly for your second choice if you could pull off a Kevin Sumlin hire would be a hell of a hire. And I think it's somebody who has connections in the South, can recruit some necessary states that but Thune Cookman needs to tap into. I mean, he's from Alabama. He's he's recruited the SEC footprint. That's where Bethune Cookman has to has to win, especially in the state of Florida. So Kevin Sumlin's a name you should look at. The only thing is, I really do think that that ship has sailed due to the fact he is the head coach for the Houston Gamblers in the USFL. And, and it it would be a tough ask for him to leave right before the season starts. Another name. That has been confirmed in terms of interviewing is Raymond Woody. Raymond Woody is a guy who, I mean, he has so many Florida ties that it's, I mean, you don't even need it. He is probably the most Florida connected candidate of all these. He was born in Palmetto, Florida, coached at Florida Atlantic, coached at Florida State, coached at South Florida, was the head coach at Palmetto High School down in Florida as well, and Bayshore High School back in the late 90s through the mid-2000s. So he's a guy who is extremely tied into your number one pipeline state in Florida. He has the connections, and right now he was he was a Willie Taggart. I would say he's from the Willie Taggart coaching tree. He coached it with Willie Taggart at Oregon, Florida State, FAU, he doesn't have a job right now based on what I can find. When Willie Taggart was was out at Florida Atlantic, right now Raymond Woody does not – he doesn't have a job right now. So, therefore, I think this would probably be the most likely candidate for the job. Kevin Sullivan has something coming up with the USFL. Raymond Woody has a little bit stronger Florida ties, has not been a head coach at the at – the, 
at the col at the collegiate level. So I think I think if I had to put money on it, I would say Raymond Woody is a name everyone needs to watch very closely, and that that would be a more likely name in my opinion than Kevin Sumlin. The the other candidate, Chinnis Berry. I don't know if he would have interest right now, man. Benedict, I don't. <laughs> I know this is going to sound crazy. I don't know if you could argue Benedict might be a better job at right this second for Bethune Cookman. Like I, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I mean it's close. Benedict is playing. He is coached at a high level at Benedict. He he's shown that he can do it at the highest level in terms of D two football. He has HBCU connections with Southern as well. Also coached at Howard, North Carolina, a and Kentucky state, Fort Valley state also has some NFL experience. So I believe he has some internships with some NFL teams as well. Chinnis Berry would be an interesting name, but it's just, is he willing to take the leap from a comfortable situation? He has at Benedict where he has an established program. They're competing, they're winning, would he take that risk into jumping jumping into this Bethune Cookman job with all the unknowns, with all the question marks and potential problems that they could have in this job? So I think Chinnis Berry is someone you at least have to see if he's interested in and whether he would potentially even just consider the job. But I think he's someone you got to make the call to. And then the final one is somebody who has said – who I've been told has reached out to Bethune about the potential opening. And he's already an FCS coach. It's Bernard Clark. He's the head coach at Robert Morris. He was born in Tampa, Florida, played for the Bengals and Seahawks. He he has a long history in Florida, man. He coached at FIU as a D coordinator from 04 to 05, was the D-line coach at South Florida, the D-line coach at FIU, was the D coordinator for one year at Hampton, was the D well, – well, Two stints at Hampton. He was the defensive coordinator in 09, defensive coordinator at 2012 to 2013. And he's been the head coach at Robert Morris since 2018. Now, the drawbacks for Clark is that he has not been very successful. He hasn't been super successful at Robert Morris. I'm just going to keep it blunt with you guys. But it's it's a university that thus far has not had a lot of success in the first place. And really and truly I don't know. I don't know how hard it would be to really build a bit winning program at Robert Morris. His first season there, he took over a two and nine program. Their last year in the NEC, he went seven and five, six and one in the NEC, finished second in that division. But last year, Robert Morris went really, really downhill, man. 0 and 11 last year for Robert Morris after they lost a lot of players to the transfer portal and they really got mauled in terms of injuries. But outside of that season, He's been decent as a head coach, and I think he's just looking to get back into his home state of Florida. He did play at the U. He played at Miami back in the late 80s, if I'm not mistaken, was a linebacker. But I think his Florida ties would make him interesting as he's up there coaching at Robert Morris. It's really out of where I would say his specialty is in terms of connecting to recruits, his high school connections and things like that. I really do think bringing him back to Bethune-Cookman I don't think he would have super high expectations coming in, but he's somebody who, in my opinion, could at least be a bridge to a but like you you I don't think anyone who has never been a head coach before or another celebrity hire is gonna work. You're gonna have to have someone who's ready to coach. And I really do think Chinnis Berry and and Bernard Clark are two names that could be extremely interesting in terms of they already have HBCU connections. So We'll see, but these are the four names that I would throw into the pot of the potential short list. Now, Sumlin and Woody did interview the first round before Bethune-Cookman hired Ed Reed. I would imagine they would circle back to both of those names. Chinnis Berry has been a candidate for every open HBCU head coach position, apparently did interview for the UAPB job before they hired Alonzo Hampton. And then Bernard Clark is somebody who has expressed potentially interest in this job but I don't I don't think Bethune Cookman has reached back out to him. And I would wonder what the narrative potentially would be if they went his direction, especially given Robert Morris has not been very successful since their move to the Big South. 
there'd be a huge, I, I, I really wonder what the hype would be, what the media coverage would potentially be like. And I wonder, I, I just don't know if Bethune wants to take that risk. So if I had to rank these in order of my picks, I th- in terms of feasibility and fit, I think one would be Woody, two would be Chinnis Berry, th- three Sumlin, four Clark. Um, would probably be my would probably be my list. Now, in terms of who I think they're going to get, I think it will. Pro- I think it's going to be Woody. Um, just because he's the only one who isn't already in an established position. He's looking for a job. Uh, he's got Florida. He's got all the Florida ties Bethune would want, and he could start immediately. Um, I, I would say Raymond Woody potentially could be the next head coach at Bethune-Cookman. And, Larry, I don't think – I've already said it, but I don't think they're going to have a coach before National Signing Day. They're going to have to take their time. I don't think – I don't think you could – you can rush it. Because the worst case scenario for Bethune Cookman is you rush it, you still don't have a great class on National Signing Day, and now you're stuck with a coach that you're not 100% sold on. I, I wouldn't worry about National Signing Day at this point. It's 10 days away. At the uh, it, It's 10 days away. If I, I would take my time, make sure I hire the right coach, and we are hitting the JUCO trail, and we are absolutely hitting the transfer portal when that next transfer portal window opens after spring. That's you have to build the bulk of your class there because I mean, let's let's just be honest. How much, how much ground do you think a new coach could realistically make up in ten days? Because let's just say, okay, let's say at best case, you're probably gonna have something to finalize by Tuesday or Wednesday. That would be best case, probably the fastest you can actually move on this. You still got to put the staff together. I mean, how much, what percentage of the staff would, would you realistically have together by next Monday? Maybe 45% best case scenario. So I, I think, I really do think you would just take your time, regroup, make sure you hire the right coach. And then just when that second portal window opens, I'm Juco kids and, Juco kids and as many as many transfer portal guys as we can get. That that's I think that's the best case you can do, Larry. Let me take this call here. Yeah. Nine seven two two, you're live. Hey, um, this is Tay. What's up, man? I think they really need to take their time because I don't know if you paid attention like Saturday. When uh, Uncle Luke did that little live chat, they had that they had a player on there, and he was just like he was just talking about Ed Reed and all the, like all he helped out with and like what they were going through. I think they really need to take their time because they gotta like rebuild like everything, like they gotta rebuild the culture before they can try to bring in players. That's my feel on it because you got. I feel bad for those 26 kids who are there and ready to commit because they really caught the worst end of the deal because, like I said, they were on, like, their last visit, like, before – well, their second to last visit before they could actually, like, put pen to paper. And so, like, I think that's what most people are seeing. And, like, no one really knew what, like, happened after that and, like, who talked to those kids. So, like, I feel like they really need to take their time. And – I don't think they should bring in Kevin Sumlin just because of the fact that he's a major name and, like, people are going to point that he's a major name and they don't want – like, it's just going to bring so much more eyes back to the situation. I think they need to let it cool down before, like, they try to bring in another major name. I, I'm for that. The only thing the only thing I would push back on is I think people get confused sometimes. To me – I don't think Kevin Sumlin counts as a celebrity hire. Like I had someone, I, I won't say who, they're they're a Jackson State person, but they they claimed I was pushing for a celebrity hire for Jackson State because I said Kevin Sumlin should be a candidate. To me, a celebrity hire is a former player with no coaching experience that is just making it off their name. To me, it like Kevin Sumlin has won in the SEC. He's won at the he's won at Houston. He's coached in the Pac-12, to me, coaches with that type of experience, I don't think necessarily count as a as a celebrity hire. People feel like 
he is a celebrity hire, which I don't necessarily understand. Like he's a hell of a football coach and has just as much experience as the next guy. So I, I don't know if people are just saying because he's coached at the highest level, he's a celebrity hire. But to me, celebrity hire means someone who with like minimal to no coaching experience that is just making it on their name. That's the only thing I would maybe push back on. Oh, yeah, I understand. Because, like, I'm just, like, with Kevin, with Kevin, like, everyone points to, like, how we, like, control, like, with Johnny Menzel. But, like, you, Johnny Menzel was, like, at the time, like, the best college football player in, 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 like, with that whole situation, like, he still won and, like, he still managed that culture. I don't know what happened with him in Arizona because, I mean, he did have a good roster, like, the first two years because he did have a little taste. But, like, after that, I don't really know what happened. But I just – I'm not saying he's a celebrity coach. I just think he's a major name, and he's going to bring eyes back to Bethune-Cookman. But it might help them just because I don't, I don't think it put them in the situation that Coach Prom nor Ed Reed put Jackson State and Bethune-Cookman. Like, they're going to be eyes, but it's not like – he knows how to, like – he knows how to, like, control, like, the media – like, Coach, like Coach Prom did. I think Ed took the – like, Ed tried to take Coach Prom's theme, but, like, he didn't have no one to, like, to help control his media, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I feel you. I also do think Kevin Sumlin's experience would make – he'd he'd be much more – he would understand, like, the coaching – not – I'm trying to find a good – like, the coaching etiquette. Like zero chance he you ever catch Kevin Sumlin on Instagram Live saying what Ed Reed did. Oh uh, yeah, but I just I just think the coach from Benedict. I'm like I've heard of like a lot of good things about him, but like that's also like I don't understand like I don't understand like especially in this situation why he would want to leave that established program that he's built to come up and try to rebuild this situation. But I I think like you said, I think that their best situation would be the guy that you named because I mean he's in Florida, he has ties of Florida, like he's already been recruiting guys from Florida in the surrounding areas. So he could just he could just help like like convince them to like come help him come to BCU and like help rebuild that program. Hey man, I appreciate your call and appreciate your perspective. Yes, sir. I let's see, Mister Ford, you're live. Hey, let me turn this thing down. Let me say this: Chinas Bear be a fool to leave uh, Columbia and come down to uh, Daytona Beach with all that mess they got going on. I agree with you. Uh, the Woody guy should have got the job originally. What's his name? Is it Raymond Woody? Yeah, Raymond Woody. He should have got the job from the beginning. Okay, it should be him. Now, I'm going to offer another thing. I would say go back and get that old staff that they had last year, minus Terry Sims, and make the guy who was the offensive coordinator that was from North Texas, make him the head coach. Isn't his name uh, Canales? What was his name? Oh, man, I don't remember his name. Now, that would be interesting. Uh, wonder... Yeah, that's who they need to get. The, the kids that would already be used to him. There's another guy on there that could be a candidate. His name is Carl Franks. Franks at one time was the head coach at Duke University. That staff they had that was quality. I'm, I'm now as far as seeing him, let's see him go on. But if you can't get this Woody guy, I'd go back and get that old staff and then make the, uh, the guy that was the offensive coordinator, make him the head coach and go from there because this is a mess. And uh, I don't think too many people going to want to go into that mess. Like you said, with what, what tra has transpired in the last uh, week or two, because I'm going to be honest with you, when I saw Ed Reed last year, it got on my nerves. It, it did. It offended me. Okay. But let me say this here. Now, a lot of them boys, if they don't get this thing right, you're going to see a lot of them kids at uh, Bethune-Cookman, they're going to show up in the swag at other schools. You, you can best believe that. You're going to see a lot of them kids show up somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, Woody would be the best. But if not, go back and bring back that old staff and make that. Uh... Listen, they said, uh, no, 
somebody, right here, you said NCCU alum 08. They said that Brian Jenkins did apply, and they told him no. The board was totally against him. Yeah, he tried to come back to Daytona, which I'm a Brian Jenkins fan. I saw him at uh, Bethune. I was impressed with him. You know, he beat Sam, what, seven? Uh, Blue, what did he beat him, seven years in a row? What did yeah, he beat something Sam? like that. Huh? Yeah, I think it was like six or seven years in a row. Yeah, because, uh, wait a minute. Bethune Cookman beat them for nine straight years, didn't it? Wasn't that right? Yeah, and then I think Terry Sims was what two? He lost, lost. Uh, he won two or three, and then he lost two. He, he lost his last two against Fam. But yeah, okay. There's another one, Sam Washington. Yeah, I, uh, I got a lot of. Rest. I saw Sam uh, win what was it? Three Celebration Bowls. I saw them games in person. So, so you know, I'm a Sam Washington guy. I asked about Sam Washington, um, uh-huh. and what I was told by an A&T alum is that there's a lot of rumors that Sam wants to take a year off, that he wants oh, to okay. just kind of sit back, see what's coming, because there was a lot of talk about him to Valley, because you know the obvious right. connections, but yeah. I, I heard that he doesn't really want to be a head coach right now and that he – possibly could take a year off or just you know go be a assistant somewhere you know kind of get out of the limelight and then reemerge as a head coaching candidate in one of the upcoming years yeah he, he yeah that's right yeah he, he's a good guy uh sam was really good man sam took over after uh what was coach's name the big guy that was at, at north carolina and one at central one at graham rod broadway he took over after Broadway. Somebody just put in here Comages. Yeah, I'm just wondering now. How old is Comages now? Is he, he in his seventies? What, what's Comages now? Oh, or I have no idea what his age is off the top of my head. Yeah, because Comages got a little age on him now. But Comages was a great coach. I followed him at uh, Tuskegee, and I watched him at uh, I watched him at Jackson State too. Okay, Blue, listen, you heard anything? What they doing at Alabama State? Anything happening over there? They doing anything? They, they landed a Bethune Cookman transfer yesterday. Who was that? Oh, uh, I think of D. Lyman. I don't think he played much at Bethune, but he they did he did transfer, which was huge because they're losing, I think, two or three starting defensive linemen next year. Right. Yeah. It's a big pickup. Okay, but how about and that's about an offense coordinator? That, that, that's it, that's I about think they're I think they're rolling with the guy they had last year. That's awful. Listen, have a good night, Blue. Appreciate you, Mr. Ford. Okay. Bye-bye. I I don't see them boycotting the season. I know some people in the chat are putting that, but I, I don't see that. Let me get to Dep- Deputy Mario's. Um, after, in, after any of the coach sees how they did every of their coaches beating down the door. I don't think there's coaches beating down the door. Now, the Robert Morris coach apparently reached out and just kind of tried to see where they were s- – where they were at and hasn't heard anything back but man there's not going to be a line of people at the door i i don't think i don't think bethune cookman fans think that i don't think the administration thinks like there's no way you have just a line of candidates dying for this job and, and that's the big thing I, I i asked a coach i text him i said what would it take for you to accept the bethune cookman job and he said that he would need in the contract a commitment to a commitment to not just improvement but like support behind the scenes he's that he was like man i need I, it's not even about contract money it's i need to make sure i'm supported and financially behind the scenes in terms of staff hires in terms of if i need something academically if i need something training wise if i need facilities wise like i he said that he would need in the con that built into the contract that they're going to give him X amount of support. And it's just, I don't know if someone asked that, how much can Bethune promise without just blatantly lying to somebody? That would be, that would be the question I would have is if someone said that and said, I need X amount of support, how much support could Bethune Cookman realistically promise them for behind the scenes stuff? I, I don't know. And on top of that, too, it, it's a big question of if you bring in a coach, whether it's Chinnis Berry, whether it's Raymond Woody, whether, whether it's Kevin Sumlin or, or, or Bernard, if they ask 
if if I was if I let's say if I was interviewing, I would say, what do you think are the three biggest challenges for this job? And I just want to see if they're being honest with me. Like, what are the three biggest challenges that I'm going to have to face if I'm the head coach of Bethune Cookman? Like you, like asking those questions in interviews are so important, and really having an understanding of the challenge that you're going to face if you say yes to this job contractually. And I think that's I think that's some things that Ed Reed didn't do. It just seemed like he man, he walked in and just started. <sighs> I, I don't know what he was expecting, but I don't I don't think he was expecting what he got. And so I think that's what you you, you can't go big celebrity hard. I, I, I don't think that's ever going to work. You cannot have that. You have to have a proven head coach or a proven coach and someone that is really going to be committed to the rebuild. And another thing another coach told me is they need at least five years on the contract. Five guaranteed years on that contract, because this is a rebuild that. I don't think there's a coach in the there, there's really not a coach in the country that could re like you are going you're going to need four to five years minimum to make to turn this program into a real competitor, and so you're going to need support behind the scenes. You're going to need a staff guarantee to a point, and and you're going and you're going to need five guaranteed years. And I can't, bro. Like I. I text coaches and ask them these questions so you can have on the show strictly on it. Cause listen, this coach, every coach I talked to is employed somewhere. I didn't talk to any unemployed coaches. I, I can't <laughs> listen. I'll say this. One of the coaches I talked to is in the swag as an assistant. That, that's all I can say. But five guaranteed years, institutional support. That's, that's, that's the minimal that people are going to be asking. And I, I don't know how much Bethune Cookman can realistically promise behind the scenes. I don't know. That's a question. That's a question for the AD, the president, the, some of the alums and we'll see. And, and the other thing is, this is a good point. This is what someone asked me as well is if the AD is also the basketball coach, how difficult is it going to be to be coaching a full basketball season in the middle of conference play and perform another head coaching search. I don't know. I, I I can't answer that. I don't, I well one, I don't know what Bethune Cookman's record is or how good their men's team is. I, I don't know. Maybe if someone in the chat can tell me, let me know, but I don't know how good, I don't know how good the basketball team is or if they're competitive in the swag or whatever, but man, it cannot be easy to be coaching a full-time division one basketball team. And on top of that, and, and, and on top of that, for do a whole coaching search, like there's zero chance. Oh, five and 13. He said, he said the men's trash bottom of the swag. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know many coaches that could be successful running an athletic department, and on top of that, running a basketball program. So I'll just say that 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 would be a tough gig. So, and I, I don't know if there's any Bethune Cookman grads who want to call in or, or people who are somewhat connected. Is there a plan to have another AD search, or are they just running with? Are are, are they just running with the AD also being the head basketball coach? There, there's got to be a, some sort of plan to make a move, right? That's but but being an AD and a coach last year, and being an AD who's having to perform their second coaching search in terms of all the challenges he's going to face and coach basketball at the same time in season, Leonard, that's got to be impossible, man. That that's that's crazy to me. Three, four, five, four. You're live. Hey Blue, this is Sergeant. What's up, sir? What's good, man? Oh, it's good. Um, just wanted to uh, hit you up one time before I turn in tonight. Uh, the bottom line uh, is, it sounds like uh, Florida A&M is going to be winning the uh, Florida Classic for the next six or seven years. Good night, sir. <laughs> hey, man. Appreciate the call. <laughs> Oh man, only Mr. Sergeant, man, only Mr. Sergeant. That's great. Um, and I'll say this, Mr. Sergeant, if 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 FAMU loses the Florida Classic this year, Willie, 
the the eyes are going to be on you. The, do it, man. Do not let FAMU lose to Florida Classic this year to Bethune Cookman. Jesus Christ. And 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 that's and and D. That's why that's why I really do think Woody's the next the next guy. There's there's no way he's going to be able to put together a whole a, a whole nother short list, go through multiple rounds of interviews, and do all that in the middle of basketball season. So you got a, like two, maybe a dark, a dark horse candidate that they interviewed. Those got to be the guys, right? And if you don't hit on those, man, oh god, I I don't know what happens if you get past Woody and someone. There could, there always could be a third candidate they interviewed, and and we just don't know about. But I just I don't, I don't know. I don't know where you go after that. To be honest with you, two six zero nine. You're live. What? What's up, man? You're live. What's up, Blue? This is Conrad from uh, MTMV Sports. What up, boy? What's good, man? Hey, man, man, I just, um, I just we just went live uh, not too long ago, man, and we wanted to touch bases on this, this whole entire topic. But I just really wanted to uh, pick your brain a little bit, man. What, what do you think that, but what, what do you think Bethune Cutler needs to do going? Because you, you just mentioned what middle of basketball season looking for a head coach. What do you think they need to do now? Um, I mentioned earlier, I, I really do think they got to take the path where they take their time. And at this point, National Signing Day, you just got to chalk that up to a loss and just do what you can in terms of putting a class together. I don't think rushing mm -hmm. a hire, hiring the wrong person in hopes that in, let's just say, what, Wednesday's best case scenario, you try to put a staff together, you might have four to five days to – potentially make up some ground how much ground could you realistically make up and like do you think you could land a game-changing recruiting class like that i don't think so try your best to get some guys who want to come to the school commit to bcu we'll get a coach asap but get past national signing day and take your time vet vet the right candidates and you need a someone who comes in is ready for the challenge and you need to make sure you vet and hire the right guy making the correct hire here is way more important than saving face in terms of the media because winning the press conference in late January is way less important than winning two, three years down the line is what I would say. Well, um, I wanted to I wanted to say this because I'm from I'm from Daytona Beach, and I wanted to say, man, uh, once they hired, when they when well, I guess when they attempted to hire uh, uh, Ed Reed, w one thing I learned is from from just just living in that area, it's an uphill battle for the school for for uh, Ed Reed. It would have been an uphill battle for Ed Reed, one because that school is. I mean, that school is the most corrupted school. I'm talking about they like it funding. Funding is lost. Not only that, the conditions there. Like I, I remember, you know, buddies of mine who played football there, and I just remember them telling me, man, I can, I can't even take a hot shower, man. You know what I'm saying? Like because the pipes are busted. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the school, and I'm just like, man, whoever comes in next, man, they got to, they got to stay quiet. They gotta stay quiet because they, you know, what I'm saying because you know now the Phil Cutman's on Front Street for, in front of the nation now, and that man, that that you know, that's bad. You know what I'm saying? That's a bad look for HBCUs because that's one of the most, I guess, I guess one of the more famous ones. I guess. Yeah, the biggest thing is that to me, the worst look was. I, I mean, he's had to know. I mean, he's from Florida, but for me, okay, I was living in an area that got hit by Katrina really, really bad when I was younger. I don't think people who haven't experienced like hurricanes and stuff understand how long it takes sometimes for funds and things like that to come along. And the fact that 
he was looking at areas that looked like they were affected by the – I mean, they got hit by, what, back-to-back hurricanes this year? I don't – Yeah, don't but, think... that's not, but that's not the first time. Oh, I'm with you. No, like, I mean, I, I'm not saying what he was saying was necessarily incorrect. I just think he took the wrong channel. Like, you can't go on Instagram Live and and approach it like he did. That's that's mm-hmm. I think that's the big holdup is that people saying that he was wrong or that Bethune doesn't have any problems. It was there's proper channels like there's professional channels you have to go through. And as the head coach of a football program, you have to carry yourself with a certain mantra to get things done and to keep your program in good light. Like the fact that he just treated it like a like a diss track on Instagram live like that. That was the that was the issue. It's not, it's not what you did or or anything, but it's how you did it. I think that really and truly has so many people upset. Okay, well, hey man, thank you, man. I just wanted to, I just want to come chime in, brother. Hey, appreciate hey, man, you calling we'll get in, some man. time, brother. I want to get you on our show. Hey, for sure, man. Hey, hit me up on social media, man. We'll get, we'll get something set up. All right, brother. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I feel like there's so many, there's so many things too that people, uh, I've been overlooking because I, I, I've been listening to some of the spaces and everything, and I just, man, some of the things people are saying are just, just insane, man. Five nine three six, you're live. Oh. Uh, blue. What's good, uh, man? Right. Uh, the only way Bethune Cookman can savage this season, they would have to hire uh, a, a winning coach to bring in. A, uh, they ha- have to hire a winning coach because uh, of the coaches going to bring in his players uh, over there to Bethune Cookman. And uh, 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 they, don't, they don't have much of uh, recruiting because the recruiting season is gone. All right? If you hire a coach uh, uh, have already been winning and they going to bring his players over there, and and what I want to say about the Ed Reed thing, you have to go in the coaching profession a hundred percent with your mind made up. It's gonna take time, a sacrifice, and m- most of all, it's gonna take money. You you not gonna be a a program without money. And you have to have all the uh, 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 all the neighborhood uh, in front of you. It's, they're gonna have to back you because uh, the, the the thing he made uh, there's a hole in the fence. Uh, he got to say, oh, "I'm a I'm a, I got to fix that hole in the fence." He got to say. Oh, there's trash right there. I'm gonna pick that trash up. But you can't come in there uh, uh, without the plan. Uh, you you have to have a plan and a dream, and you have to have a way to carry that plan out. But but he he went at this thing the wrong way. Uh, he he's he's a good player, but uh, I would have liked to see what he was gonna do at Bethune Cookman. But uh, it's gonna be hard for him to get back in the coaching uh, fraternity now because uh, he 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 failed at his first job, and the the, the other coaches gonna other schools gonna look at him. Uh, 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 gonna turn her pale eye to him because he he bad mouthed the school. Uh, 
I, I, that's all I got to say. Hey, I appreciate you calling and you know giving um giving your opinion, man. I appreciate it. I, I watch you. I, I watch you all the time and on off script. You know I had a stroke, blue, and um, I I watched that guy off. You're good. You can keep going. Uh, uh, I watched that guy on off script when I had the stroke. He brought me through that stroke because I used to sit in bed and watch off script all the time. And uh, it, his, my voice is, it's, 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 uh, it's coming back. But I've been in the coaching profession uh, for, for 40 years. And Blue, I have put guys in the NFL, guys into professional baseball, guys into uh, Olympic gold medals. But I, 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 I'm interested in uh, HBCU football. And uh, I hope that the Bethune Cookman, uh, have uh, come back online and valid too. I, I completely agree with you, Manny. Yeah, I, I remember you calling in to all script back in the day, man, um, all the time. And I appreciate you calling into my show and I appreciate your support. Uh, I thank you. Absolutely, man. Have a good one. Hey man, shout out, shout out, shout out to him, man. I, I appreciate him calling in, man. He's making a lot of progress, and I know he's been through a lot, so I want to give him a shout out. But um, yeah, man. In case I, I think a lot more people are kind of tuning in now to uh, Kevin Sumlin, Raymond Woody, two candidates who have already interviewed for the job before Bethune Cookman hired Ed Reed. Potential candidates moving forward. Raymond Woody would probably be my pick. He he comes from the Willie Taggart coaching tree. And right now, does I, from what I'm told, does not have a coaching job. And Kevin Sumlin with the with with the USFL, I think it'd be a really really tough push to get him to leave right before the season starts. Bernard Clark, Robert Morris, head coach, has uh ha- has potentially reached out and expressed some interest. It'll be interesting to see if Bethune Cookman will. Um, <sighs> It'll be interesting if, if if they give him a real look. And then Chinnis Barry Benedict, uh, head coach who has won at at the highest level. It'll be. It'll, I think they should give him a call. But a lot of people don't think he would leave Benedict for this Bethune Cookman job. Three one two four. You're live. Okay. Three one. Two four, you're live. Uh, yes. Um, I just want to give a comment to the, about the Ed Reed situation. And my problem, my problem with this is simple: when you apply for a job, you have to have respect for people. And going in and trashing your employee about what you do not like, first sign the contract and get the job. Then once you get the job. Then you make gradual changes, but have respect for somebody. For all those other people who are complaining that he exposed something, they had two hurricanes to come in there. So even if he had a PWI, went through two hurricanes, and it's a major university, they still going to have issues. So the thing about it is I think he has done damage to celebrity coaches now. So now these HBCUs who normally would give these celebrity coaches opportunities they're going to vet them real closely because they're trying to damage the brand and they don't have a love for HBCU. They just have a love for themselves and their celebrity liberty to move, to go to the next step instead of trying to help the children um, reach the next level. That's hey, my I, comment. Hey, I appreciate you calling in and giving your opinion. But I, I don't I don't think people are okay, so the people on one side I don't think are 
putting one like putting one and one together and getting two one you can't have like the biggest thing like me being when i when i stepped into the space you know not knowing as much as i needed to uh, one of the big things that the mr campbells the mr fords a lot of the people that kind of really help you know help me along here is you can't have a conversation about facility support everything like that without talking about one the underfunding in terms of, of in terms of governmental funding and it's like if they're if, if a school's already not getting the proper funding and has been underfunded for years how in the world are we expecting and just saying that when two hurricanes came through that Bethune Cookman was on the top of the list to get the help that they needed to restore the campus and restore certain buildings and restore um just just everything that they they needed to get back on their feet if like if if schools are not getting the proper funding then how are we i don't i don't think i, I think that's kind of crazy to expect that they're going to be one of the first universities campuses to to get the support that they need in terms of her you know after hurricane support or even just upkeep support that they need week in and week out i i, I don't know maybe i'm missing something but i, I just think that that's crazy I, I don't know but the the trash the one trash thing if i was not mistaken the one trash the one trash building is is stuff that they had to pick up from the hurricane it's stuff they had to pick up from the hurricane that they put in a building to consolidate the trash. I don't think people understand that. Like one of the buildings was hurricane trash put in a building that they just ha didn't have anywhere to put it yet. Like that's, that is, that's wild to me. And the, the office cleaning man, come on. Like, I don't know. I just, Oh Lord, this is, this is outrageous. But listen, Let's let's get to the transfer portal here, man. Before we work back around it, I'll take y'all's calls. Um, a lot of a lot of people have been wanting to kind of get an update on the transfer portal. The first transfer po transfer portal window is closed. Um, so what that means now is that new players cannot enter the portal, but if you're already in the portal, you are free to commit at any time, any time. So I think that's a big misconception. People are like, well, the portal's closed. You can't commit anywhere. You can commit as long as you are already in the portal, but now you cannot enter um, the transfer portal until the after spring practice, which is the next uh, transfer portal window. I think it's 15 or 30 days after spring practice. Um, so Mike Swain Jr., can, former Campbell linebacker, DB, two-time all-district selection, first-team offensive all-district selection in high school, announces his transfer to Towson, a huge pickup for uh, Pete Shinnick, the new head coach up there for Towson. They've been loading up on the trans uh, in terms of the transfer portal, trying to compete in the loaded CAA. Also, J.J. Evans, former Auburn wide receiver, was a consensus four-star prospect coming out of high school. His junior year, his senior year, was kind of marred with injuries. 1,700 receiving yards, 18 receiving touchdowns. He announces his transfer to North Alabama. A huge, huge pickup for Brent Deerman. They have a a really, really deep staff in terms of Alabama, Florida connections, and they're really going to recruit the South at, at a high level. And so J.J. Evans is a major, major pickup for their offense. And then the next one, Tyler Long, Norfolk State, a huge loss for Norfolk State. I feel going into 2023 – uh, Norfolk State is going to be on the hot seat. And just in terms of the entire program, they have lost a lot of talent. There's still a lot of questions at the quarterback spot. And last year was really bad for Norfolk State. And I don't see anywhere that they've improved their roster this offseason. And so if they finish last in, last in the MEAC again, what is the narrative going going to be going, going forward? I just... Norfolk State has a lot of question marks, but Tyler Long, two-time MEAC All-Conference selection, was a first-team All-Conference, 100-plus tackles this year, was a really good candidate for MEAC Defensive Player of the Year, was an All-Northeast Conference selection coming out of high school. He announces his contract to uh, his his uh, I'm reading the comments too. He announces his transfer to Austin P. I have a on the website the blue blood CFB.com. I have an interview with Tyler Long where he kind of talks about 
his reasoning for transferring for Norfolk State, why he chose Austin P, and 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 how he plans to fit in the defense. He was really really excited about the scheme fit. It was a scheme that he ran ran in high school, but has not yet run in college. And he really does feel like he's going to unlock the potential of his game at the college level. Now. Another transfer, former four-star Michigan State defensive end Chase Carter transfers to Incarnate Word. He was the number one player coming out of the state of Minnesota out of high school, had 27 tackles for loss and 13 sacks as a senior, did not see a lot of action at Michigan State, winds up coming back to Texas to play for Incarnate Word, a massive pickup, especially with Incarnate Word. Man, they got so much talent on the defensive line, and Chase Carter is going to be able to fit multiple different positions. I wonder if they can put some weight on him, slide slide him into maybe a, a three tech in some in some you know pass rushing sets. They got to they got to load up on defensive tackle, but edge is loaded, and Chase Carter is just the next big one to head to Incarnate Word. Brandon Johnson. Idaho State wide receiver announces his transfer to Jackson State. He was the first team all San Diego selection out of in what I believe was his JUCO. It was like a weird prep transition year for him. And six, 626 receiving yards, 10 touchdowns in that one year, and I believe only eight games. Um, Brandon Johnson, a major pickup at wide receiver. We already know. Jackson State's loaded at receiver, but what Brandon Johnson brings is another big body wide receiver. I think they're going to be able to utilize him in the red zone because he has an excellent vert, does a great job at high pointing the football. And on top of that, what a lot of lankier, taller receivers lack in terms of route running, I think Brandon Johnson could I really do think he he can offer something intermediate that has been lacking with some of the longer, bigger wide receivers for Jackson State. And I, Yannick, I believe is how you pronounce it, is, is Yannick, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, commits to FAMU, Buffalo offensive lineman. Number, he was the number 58 player in the state of Maryland coming out of high school, was a top 200 interior offensive lineman in the class of 2021 with Jalen Goss and, and, and some of the departures on that FAMU offensive line. This was a massive pickup. FAMU has had a really solid offensive line these past few years. They needed to beef up a little bit on the interior going into next season. And in the future, I, th- I think Yannick can compete for a starting spot this year, at least be a rotational piece of, of a key depth piece, you should say, for FAMU going into next season, but a massive pickup for all three of these teams. Another transfer portal update, man, Marcus Brown, Incarnate Word is loading up, man. I'm telling you, former Howard defensive lineman Marcus Brown headed to Incarnate Word was a MEAC all-conference selection this season. 50 total tackles, three sacks, seven and a half for loss for um, for Howard in his career. A massive, massive pickup for Incarnate Word as they get another all-conference contributor to add to that defensive line. Jack Forsyth, another Howard transfer, Howard offensive lineman. He was a blue blood second team all MEAC selection. Missed some of the season this year due to injury, but he was one of the highest graded offensive linemen in the MEAC. Has 13 career starts for the Bison. He announces his transfer to Northern uh, Northern Arizona, the same place Devon Starling, Tennessee State running back, is also going to be headed. Austin P with another big pickup, Michael Rutland Jr., former Princeton defensive back. He was a first-team Ivy League selection this past season, had three interceptions in 2022. He's going to bring a lot of length. Um, he's he's going to bring a lot of length to that defensive back room, especially that true corner position. It was a spot that Austin P really needed to have another solid contributor at, and it's a massive, massive pickup. One of the top transfer portal pickups, according to On Three, he's the this is Michael Rutland. Austin P is the only FCS to FCS transfer to be in the top 250 in terms of rankings for On Three. So a massive pickup for Austin P here. Another one, Jaden Stewart, former Prairie View A&M running back, almost 2,000 yards rushing, 21 touchdowns over three seasons for the Panthers, is headed to Stephen F. Austin. This was a massive loss for PV. There were times where, and there were really times where he was the mo- by far the most explosive option offensively for PV, and they they bring them into Stephen F. Austin where they're losing Xavier Gibson and some of their other top offensive weapons. I would expect Jaden Stort to be an immediate contributor for the Lumberjacks next season. 
Massive pis, uh, pickup for Eastern Kentucky. Tony Davis, former Duke defensive back. He was a consensus four-star prospect coming out of high school, was a four-time All-Big South 3A selection in high school, a three-time All-Gaston Gazette selection. He is going to be a massive piece to the secondary rebuild for Eastern Kentucky as they look to compete again for a playoff spot. They got to the playoffs this year, lost to Gardner-Webb in the first round. This is a major, major pickup as you get a consensus four-star transfer in Tony Davis, who just really never found his footing at Duke. Now, Southeastern Louisiana, you know what they're losing at quarterback, but Cameron Cooper, a former four-star prospect, former Washington State Hawaii quarterback, is coming in, was the Utah Gatorade Player of the Year his senior year. This kid has an absolute cannon on him and can absolutely sling it, man. So Cameron Cooper expected to come in, compete with Zachary Clement potentially for that starting quarterback spot for SLU next season. Now, even more transfers, man. Um, <clears throat> Devon Starling headed to Northern Arizona. I mentioned it earlier. Ten former Tennessee State running back had some issues off the field with a staffer, and uh, it just it, it didn't work out. And I think he just needed a change of scenery. He was an he was the OVC freshman of the year, an FCS Hero Sports sophomore, All American, and was in real in his best game this year. Came against Eastern Washington, who's a big sky team, 200 plus yards, a touchdown, as he almost led the Tigers to an upset win week one this year on the road against Eastern Washington. And a big pickup for NAU is Kevin Daniels, their all conference running back, hit the transfer portal. They also lost RJ Martinez, another big loss for NAU, but Devon Starling coming in to add some serious, serious depth in that room. Jalen Bell, Mississippi Valley State transfer defensive lineman, was a two-time feel still SWAC all-conference selection. Over his career at Valley, 26 and a half tackles for loss, 12 sacks at Valley. The kid is just an animal. He's he He's not super tall, but, man, he plays with this aggression. Him, Ronnie Thomas, even going back, um, I'm blanking on the kid, Rodney Gardner, all these guys are kind of smaller for their position, but they play with such force, such anger, that they're just unblockable at times. And so Jalen Bell, due to the graduation of, I believe, Teray Jones is headed out at defensive tackle for Tennessee State, who was an all-conference selection. Jalen Bell immediately steps up and replaces him, brings a lot of experience to the interior of that Tennessee State defensive line, a massive pickup for Tennessee State as they land Jalen Bell. Now, Amon Scarborough, former Jacksonville State DB, I forgot to mention this to Mr. Ford, but headed to Alabama State, was a 2020 Alabama High School State Athletic Association State Champion and was an all-South Metro team selection in the secondary. Really did, couldn't find his footing at Jacksonville State, staying in state, transferring to Alabama State, and should I, – th- I really do think Scarborough is going to fit into the spot that like Earshad Davis was at. And so I I personally think this is going to be a massive pickup for Alabama State. They already on one side have, I think, Maddox is going to be a first-team SWAC all-conference pick next year. That kid at corner, that that Maddox is is just different. But Amon Scarborough can fit in in the safety spot and add some a lot of depth for Alabama State. Now, I didn't want to go all night in the transfer portal, but we do have some recruiting updates. So these are kids from JUCO slash high school that have committed to FCS programs. Now, I'm excited about this one. If I didn't have the live stream tonight, I was going to make a separate video on this kid because I was so excited. Aces Scott, he played at Georgia Military College, was a defensive end, commits to Central. This kid is legit. This kid is a problem off the edge. Was a JUCO All-American honorable mention this kid missed over half the season, guys. Listen, half, this kid missed almost half the season this year and still had 13 tackles for loss and 12 sacks. I want to, I, I need, I, listen, I, I will, I'm going to pull up his, <laughs> his stats from, uh, let's see, I think it was Georgia, let's see, Georgia. So he played seven games, seven games, and had 13 tackles for loss and 12 sacks. 
that is insane. And I, I want to repeat this. Okay, this is not me exaggerating. They played Gordon State College after he missed three games with injuries in the middle of the season. Against Gordon State College, he had six sacks in one game. Six sacks in one game. That's just mind-blowing to me. Six sacks in one game? That doesn't even make that doesn't even make I, I don't I've never seen I don't think I've ever seen that done. But man, six sacks is a massive um, uh, is, this is a massive pickup for North Carolina Central on the edge. I, I said last year they did not have a true edge rusher that I really trusted to get after the quarterback. Asa Scott is that guy. Just telling I expect him to step right in and be that edge rusher they need when he is on and he is healthy. He is an absolute issue off the edge and so asa scott to north carolina central man i really wanted to highlight him because uh if 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 this live stream wasn't coming up he was going to get his own video on the channel also steve hall uh plays up at uh in st louis is a three-time all-state selection he announces his commitment to lindenwood he's a he's a two to slash three star he's one of those borderline kids i don't know how he's a two slash three star I, I don't understand it. Steve Hall last season, almost 1,500 rushing yards, 10.4 yards per carry, and 18 rushing touchdowns in 2022. That is, I mean, his highlights are just him breaking away from people. I mean, this kid for an entire season for like 12 games this year averaged 10 yards a carry. 10 yards a carry for the entire season, a massive pickup for Lindenwood, who had an extremely explosive offense in their first season at the FCS level. They're still, they'll be enter, entering their second season next year, but their offense has already been electric, and Steve Hall could be the next big thing at running back for them. Also, Terry and Rainey, he played at Olivet Nazarene, which is a NAIA school. He was the offensive lineman of the year for his conference, was an NAIA All-American this year. The guy has ridiculous size. His film, he had one of the most exciting films that I've watched for offensive line. I'll have to do a film breakdown on I'll have to I'll have to I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll have to do a f- side breakdown next live stream on him. But Rainey's headed to Idaho, a massive pickup for the Vandals. And I'm really, really excited to see his potential. He has two years left, if I'm not mistaken. But Terry and Randy's one of the he had some of the best offensive line film I've watched all offseason. So reason he was the offensive lineman of the year. But the Vandals returning Giovanni McCoy at quarterback, the Jerry Rice Award winner, returning all the American Hayden Hatton. The Vandals are going to be a problem in the big sky this upcoming season. And Randy's going to be a massive piece along that offensive line. Now Northern Colorado lands Richard Stallworth. He, he plays over at Yuma Catholic over in Arizona. He's a top 60 player in the state of Arizona. In three seasons, he's thrown for over 12,000 yards and 168 passing touchdowns. The kid is just a gunslinger, and when he's in the pocket, if you give him time, he is an absolute problem, a massive pickup for Northern Colorado this offseason. I, I believe he's a three-star the kid at Yuma, I, he's already has the record for most passing yards in Yuma Catholic history. He's making a run for the most passing yards in the state of Arizona history. The kid's just a baller. And the fact that he's winding up at Northern Colorado is crazy. And Northern Colorado is going to have a problem at quarterback when Stallworth develops and has his time. I don't know if this Bethune-Cookman pickup will hold. I'll just say that. He could always transfer, but for right now, Phoenix Tusa did commit to Bethune Cookman, was a Long Beach Poly defensive lineman, was a first team press telegram selection this past season. 19 tackles for loss, 10 and a half sacks this past season. He plays down in the edge rusher role, can move into defensive tackle in certain schemes. I do think you'll have to put a little bit of weight on to continue to do that at the college level, but the kid plays really well with his hands. He's explosive and is just a playmaker in big situations. But Phoenix Tusa headed to Bethune Cookman. Jamar Jones headed to Chattanooga is my final one. He plays over at, at Pope John Paul High School, plays defensive line over there, was a Division II AAA All State selection. For his career, 38 and a half tackles for loss, 16 and a half career sacks. He is a problem, a, a high three-star kid headed to Chattanooga, held some 
FBS offers, decided to stay a little bit closer to home in Chattanooga. And this was a massive, massive pickup for the Mocs, who are losing Devontae Maxwell in the interior of the defensive line. And Jamar Jones is going to add some much-needed depth down inside. But listen, man, a uh, great show. I'm going to give you guys probably another 10-ish, 15 minutes to call in if you want. 701-779-9585. And just to recap some of the things we talked about earlier, this Bethune Cookman thing, I, I really didn't I, I really didn't want to get into like the trash and everything. It's just not that's not what I want to do here. I just wanted to talk about what was next. Now, Kevin Sumlin, Raymond Woody are two people who have already interviewed for the job before Ed Reed was hired. Probably going to get circled back to again. Chinnis Berry at Benedict is a name to watch. Then you also got Bernard Clark, head coach at Robert Morris, has, who has a strong Florida ties, was born down in Florida, who has potentially expressed some sort of interest in the job. Those are some four names you should watch. I would put money on Raymond Woody as he's currently not employed anywhere from what I can tell after – uh, Willie Taggart is out at FAU. So look for Raymond Woody to be a really key name to look for in this race. And so I just wanted to kind of give you guys a look into what's going on with the coaching search and, and, and what's going on behind the scenes. Man, I think there's been too much talk of just trashing, uh, trashing everyone. And, and I will say, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm always looking back. I remember saying on a live stream right after the season, it was one of the playoff recap episodes. Um, I I told everyone I did not think Bethune Cookman should have fired Terry Sims this year, and <laughs> it I just man with everything that was going on with in terms of the hurricane, all the craziness that was happening, man, I think Terry Sims needed one more year. I really do, and. I just with everything I know that everyone was just looking for the next big thing, but I just felt like with everything that happened, you could have given them given them one more year. If it didn't work out, then it is what it is. But they lost a lot of games. Like they, they were competitive in a lot of games this year. And I just I I don't I don't I don't think looking, you know, hindsight's always 2020, man. I, I still think Terry Sims could have got another year and, and a lot of the a lot of this definitely could have been avoided, man. I, I really do. And I, I just hate to see it. I, I I definitely, definitely hate to see it. I'm trying to find some of these comments. Yeah, his his quarterback is um his quarterback is in the portal. Um me, I, I talked about it on the Excuse me. I, I talked about it at the round table and I I thought he was going to look pretty hard at South Carolina State, potentially Morgan. But if his coach goes down to Bethune. I don't see why he wouldn't take that take that shot with him. I, I, don't, I don't see why he wouldn't follow him down there. Well, you can't keep your job at Bethune Cook if you don't beat FAMU. That's right. I mean, what was his overall record against Fam Leonard? Was it like two and two, two and three, something like that? Because I know we got two wins over Fam when he first started. But I don't I don't know what his overall record was. Uh Jalen Goss and Cam COVID. That's huge, Jordan. If that Jalen Goss was, I think, one of the more underrated, overlooked offensive linemen in the SWAC this year. Uh man, he has such a good year. And Cam Coven was pretty good, but man, J J Jalen Goss should get whenever he leaves FanView, Jordan. If he has another big year, I wouldn't be surprised if he got a look at the next level. I got to look. I, I don't know his measurables off the top of my head, but his film and technique and his ability to just be a just be an absolute monster up there, man. I think he should get a look at the next level. I really, really like Jalen Goss's game. Now, uh, I well, I forgot his name. Uh, Jordan, it's the it was the kid who got hurt week zero. I think he transferred in from South Florida. He was the offensive tackle. I think he started offensive tackle against UNC, and he went out that game with the injury. I want to say it's Cesar uh, Ruiz is his name, Jordan. But if he's coming back too, that's a huge pickup. I think he has a lot of a lot of promise in terms of what what, what his potential could be at the offensive tackle spot. But man, we'll give y'all five more minutes, man. Seven zero one seven seven nine nine five eight five is the call-in number right here at the top of the screen. If NCCU gets a legit pass rush, it's going to be a problem. 
I'm, I, I agree with that because I don't think there will be – I don't think – I don't think NCCU is – going to have any offensive problems but I think they're returning most of their uh most of their offensive production now offensive line Rob I will say makes me a little bit worried um they lost t- losing Robert Mitchell of course to graduation and then uh the transfer of Corey Bullock are huge but I do think NCCU had enough depth to potentially replace that it's just Man, anytime you lose two big contributors like that, it does make me worry a little bit, Rob. So that would, it, shockingly, that's probably my biggest concern right now for NCCU is just how do you replace those two monsters on offensive line? Yeah, Jalen Goss says, man, oh God, he's that's ridiculously big. That's his size is re- just outrageous. Um, let me think about the O lineman, Paris. Are you talking about the the kid from Minnesota? If if it's the kid from Minnesota, I'm always gonna I'm always gonna be honest. I would be shocked if he is a starter this year. He his film looked like he was just picking on people a little bit like smaller than him. I think he has a lot of development in terms of his technique and his pad level, but he he's got potential. But man, his film, his high school film was inter. I, I was really surprised he was a four star coming out of high school. I think he has a lot of development to do. There's not a lot of film of him at Minnesota. I'm interested to see how he developed at a Big Ten school for two years. Um, but I will say I would be shocked if he's a starter this year. I think the I think the tackles Jackson State has coming back are better than him, just right now from what I've seen. Back. Two back. three eight eight, you're live. No blues double three. What's good, man? Hey, did, hey, did the um the coach that left West Florida and went to Towson? Did he take his whole staff with him up there? He took a, a lot of it. Okay. Okay. And and Carnate Word, you said they got a quarterback transferring in? They got a kid from ECU who transferred in, and then they also got Zach Calzada, who played at Auburn and Texas AM, was a consensus four star. I think he started eleven games at AM and then missed last season at Auburn because of a shoulder injury. But he's headed back to Texas and he'll probably be their starting quarterback next year. He not he not a senior, is he? I think Calzada has two years of eligibility left. Okay, okay, all right. So incarnate word look like they're gonna make another run. I got them winning the Southland again. I'll be sh- I'd be shocked if they don't make it to the quarterfinals again, based on what they have roster wise. Okay. I mean, they've landed ten FBS transfers at this point. Ten? Yeah, ten. Yeah, I don't know what they doing over there at that school, but they be they be steady loading up. Even that they be, you know, every year a new coach and a new quarterback, they be steady loading up over there. I have they a know. I have an interview with the coach dropping tomorrow. Okay, uh, for the economic word coach. Yeah, their new head coach. I got an interview with him tomorrow. Is he even thirty? I thought he was like thirty-two or something. Mad young. Yeah, he's he's in his low thirties. I mean, the the dude looks my age. <laughs> it, it, All right, good show. Crazy. Hey, appreciate you calling in, man. Appreciate. Oh, let's see, Garrett. I haven't heard anything about Garrett Schrader. Um, Campbell updates. I, I don't think they've landed. I don't think they've landed anyone else. They they did have one kid flip on them. They had that four. They had the four star kid from Ole Miss. He flipped to. Um, oh, I want to say it, it was one of those. It was like UConn or UMass, one of those weird schools like that that shockingly land weird prospects. I think he flipped to one of those, but outside of that, their class is about the same. In term, if you mean like how I think they're gonna do, uh, it's the first year in the CAA. I want. I don't. I don't remember what their full schedule looks like, but. That they got William and Mary super early in the season. If if I think Campbell's kind of in the same boat C as North Carolina A and T. If you can get five six wins, that's a that's a huge huge year 
in your first season in the CAA. I really do. I really wish Campbell would have had one more year in the Big South so they really could have seen what all that talent can do put together. But it's going to be a massive transition to compete in the CAA when you got William and Mary, Richmond, Elon, um, Delaware, Villanova, uh, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. I mean, it's going to be week in and week out, extremely hard to win. So I would say they're probably about in the same boat as A&T right now in terms of expectations. No, I don't think they'll ever put an age limit on players as long as you don't um, exceed your four to five years of eligibility, whatever it is, um, you'll be fine. They'll never put an age limit on players because you never – because they don't – the reason they won't put an age limit on players is – because you can't just say football. You have to you have to say it has to be like an instant of play rule. And with baseball, as long as you don't use up your eligibility, you can always come back. And, and some guys will go straight out of high school to play major league baseball. If those guys want to come back, they can they should still be able to play sports. Um, so I don't think you'll ever see an age limit put on that. Raymond Woody, Reg, I would say Raymond Woody would be my pick. I think Kevin Sumlin is probably going to be called up with USFL stuff. And I think Raymond Woody out of the other three candidates are the most realistic and the one with a lot of the, a lot of Florida ties who hasn't really gotten his shot as a head coach and probably is going to be most motivated to show out. Uh, Paris, I haven't seen his film. I'll I'll look at his film and I'll, I'll let you know next live stream what I think of uh, his film, but I don't think I've watched it yet. Oh, let's see. Campbell and UIW must have some serious booster money to be pulling the talent. (laughs) Maybe. I, I don't know, man. They are, they're they're killing it. I don't know if Walter. I I think if I'm not mistaken, his dad tweeted at FAMU. If if I'm if I'll have to find the tweet, but I believe his dad tweeted at FAMU. So I don't know if he's staying or, or he's looking for another opportunity. But I'm ho- it'd be nice if Walter Simmons uh, stayed. Apparently, Bethune, uh, uh, Mr. Forrest said Brian Jeek has contacted Bethune and they didn't want him back. Who we picked up? Cam, 68 Allen, 65 DQ, 64 Rosa. Six, we offered Gray, 69, Blue, 66 Q, Q Davis, 68. Massive offensive lineman, man. Incarnate World almost beat NDSU this year. They did. The other big news, I, I didn't put it on a slide because I, I think a lot of people already knew. Uh, South Dakota State head coach John Stiglmeyer retired after winning the national championship this year. Man, he coached like 20 plus seasons. He really valued spending times with his spending time with his grandkids and, and his wife and everything like that. So it, it I think the fact that he got to go out on top and he coached South Dakota State from the transition from D2 to FCS, and the fact that he stayed with that program and coached them to a national championship all the way from the Division II level, man. I think it just meant too much to him. And there's no better way to go out. You get an FCS championship against your in-state rival who were the big bad boys of uh, of the conference. And, and you know, I, th- I really do think, man, he, he went out on top. And, and there's no better way to go out. You can't write a better script to retire to than John Stiglmeyer did. They, they promoted the defensive coordinator, Jimmy Rogers, who has been – Stig's probably top assistant for I believe 10 years. He was the longest tenured assistant under Stig. Coached one of the top defenses in the country this past season. They ranked number one in rush defense, number three in scoring defense. And so I don't see them taking a step back. I should have an interview this week with Jimmy Rogers, the new head coach at South Dakota State. If you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll put it on my social media. South His opening press conference, chills, man. I don't I don't think South Dakota State is going anywhere. And I would not be surprised if Jimmy Rogers takes South Dakota State and repeats next year. Just to let y'all know, this is how insane South Dakota State is going to be next year before I get out of here. Uh, Sam Herder posted their two deep. Zach Hines, the tight end, said he was coming back for another year of eligibility. Both the Yankee twins are coming back. Granowski's coming back. Isaiah Davis is coming back. Um um, Amir Johnson's coming back, both Yankee twins, a lot of the team. They are returning 18 starters from this national championship team. And they're returning, like, I believe it's 30 something players from the two deep. It's something just ignorant in terms of what they're bringing back. So South Dakota State's not going there. I mean, they're returning almost the entire two deep from last season. 
South Dakota State is going to be a whole issue next year, man. I'm extremely excited to see what that team looks like, man. They got so much talent coming back. I did see him. I think I talked to – I don't – Bobby, don't quote me, but I feel like I talked about him two or three live streams ago. But, man, the kid's so explosive, and I really do think he has the the build to be an every down back, which is something that – I mean, with all the injuries, fam, you had, it was just hard for them to find any consistency at the running back spot. So a massive, massive addition, man. I do I do agree. I, he has a lot of potential. I think, fam, you did a nice job addressing of all their needs. And listen, I, I'm going to post another mailbag kind of post on, on all our social media, on the community page. I want you guys to comment the topics I want to talk about. I have some from the post previously that I'm going to address next week on the live stream. But listen, guys. I appreciate y'all tuning in, man. It's been an insane start to the off season. National signing days on the on the way, and y'all know me being a recruiting guy. I cannot wait. A lot of coverage of recruiting will can be found on our website, thebluebloodcfb.com. If you're not a member, listen, man, hit the hit the subscribe and like button first. If you want to see me and Coach Fred break down the film of the Celebration Bowl, go ahead and join either level of the membership. I think it's like two ninety nine or four ninety nine. For either level, you can catch our exclusive film breakdowns all season long. We started with the Celebration Bowl last week, an hour of film breakdown ex available exclusively for members due to copyright. And on top of that, this week we're doing the FCS National Championship from this season. And then we're going to start polling members to see what games they want us to break down. And we're going to do that up until the start of the 2023 season. Um, it is allowed because it's it's allowed due to the fact that we're cutting up the film and we're offering um, our take. So therefore, um, it's allowed because it's like fair use because we're just breaking down the film and we're also trying not to use like we're trying to cut it up enough. Listen, we I went through like two hours of trying to cut up that film way. So yeah, it's, we're good. The first one went by good. And um, so if you want to see the Celebration Bowl uh, thing, go ahead and join the membership FCS National Championship coming. I think Jackson State, Alcorn State from this year was one that was voted on. And then there was Incarnate Word, Sac State. But then we'll get some of your recommendations. Also, interview with Incarnate Word head coach Clint Kill uh, Killo available tomorrow. We'll have an exclusive article available on the website as well. well I'm working on getting Alonzo Hampton from UAPB. UAPB wanted to wait up until his introductory press conference. So I'm trying to get that rescheduled. That's coming. I'm working with Valley to hopefully get Kendrick Wade as well. And then I got some other first year head coaches that I'm in the works of getting on the show. I want to try to highlight as many first year head coaches um, that I can. Oh, let's see. Hang on. Let's see the linebacker that wants to come back from the draft and play. If he also, Wayne, if he hired an agent, he can't come back. But if he didn't hire an agent, I, th I believe as long as it's not past whatever. Oh, it's the twenty second. I think the deadline's passed. Never mind. I don't. I don't think he's allowed. I don't it, unless the if the deadline's passed, Wayne, it's not allowed. If the deadline to declare for the draft has passed, he he's stuck. That's brutal. Okay, he didn't hire an agent. As long as he could probably apply to the NCAA to find some sort of loophole. I'm hoping. But yeah, the Yankee Twins. Could have went pro, but they came back. But listen, guys, appreciate y'all tuning in, man. I'm out of here. But until next time, guys, the Blue Bloods are out. Mm -hmm.